what's up Goldie here and I'm gonna be going over the big 12 game main slate that we have here on uh, Wednesday June 14 um, interesting slate here today once again full 12 games so that's nice and we got a lot of pitching that we can get to I think um, some ownership concerns I would say um, but I think mostly everything after a first look here is pretty much in line uh, naturally filtering to the top of the spectrum here, pricing spectrum that is, um, and I think the market is actually kind of sharp here so far in the early going. Um, I don't see too many exploitable ownership spots necessarily. Uh, I think you can convince me that, uh, a lot of these numbers are probably in the range that they, they should be. Um, if we're building, you know, an equitable sort of, uh, sort of lineups. Now we can obviously exploit a lot of this, right? There's some spots, notably one at the top end of the spectrum that should jump off the page here is like a Merrill Kelly in terms of ownership, 17 or seven and a half percent ownership with a 17 point projection. Yeah. It's lower than the other guys. Yeah, of course. But that still makes him a fine tournament play. So we can exploit some of this ownership here, not because they're bad plays necessarily, but because the numbers are high and this is a 12-game slate. Um, we can just try and, and get to some different lineup constructions. Now, down here on the lower end of the spectrum, really not a lot that we're excited about playing. Um, we've kind of been lacking a little bit of value down here in the lower range over the last little while. There's a couple guys that we might be able to consider mostly in the upper sixes and low sevens. Probably going to stay off of um, nearly everybody down here in the in the fives and low sixes or whatever outside of maybe a sneaky Ranger Suarez down here um, at uh, 5,600 or something like that. So that said, we've got... Uh, a full 12 games. Let's just get into it, and uh, we'll try and keep this, you know, to about an hour once again. Um, first game of the night: Toronto and Baltimore. Now, I think this is kind of a similar game to yesterday <sighs> with the Blue Jays and the O's. Uh, 8,600 on the mound for Jose Barrios, and Josie has been much better this season um, compared to last season, at least. Right, really gotten the the four seamer value under control still throws a lot of the two seamer so i'm not super jacked about that that still makes him a little bit vulnerable to the left side of the plate and we see that materializing here full 20 percent usage given up and out to the field on the changeup. that's translating to a 174 iso allowed to the lefties with a 283 average kind of elevated numbers here just a 22 23 percent strikeout rate bad average there um Getting ground balls, however, staying down in the strike zone. He's always had a pretty good ground ball two-seamer. Stays down with the slider as well. This has always been his best pitch, the slider. So, for the most part, he's always been pretty good against right-handers. Uh, where we want to go after him is with the lefties still. But he's far less attackable this year than he was last year, for example. So, um, I'm kind of down, at least compared to yesterday on the Orioles in that respect. But we can still get to Gunner, right? He's really seeing the baseball. You can play him probably against most righties in, in baseball at the moment. Um, hitting with a lot of confidence up at the top of the lineup. He'll be there again while Cedric is out. Third and shortstop eligible. He only got a $100 price bump today. So you can, you can play this again. Far less attackable spot, though, because Josie Barrios doesn't give up nearly as much hard contact to the lefties. He's not nearly as susceptible as a Chris Bassett, for example. Um, so I'm even more down on Rutch and a Santander at their same... Santander, you've got a $300 price bump today at their same price tags, relatively, uh, than I was yesterday. So it'd be Gunner and like a Ryan O'Hearn actually seeing the baseball pretty well. He's a fly ball hitter against right-handers. And that's really kind of who we want here, fly ball and line drive guys. Josie with a 22% line drive rate against the left side. And giving up more production. So I'm mostly going to stay off the righties here uh, on a full 12-game slate. It'd be, once again, just a short stack, even though the O's kind of made me look like an idiot, put up an 11 spot last night. 
it'd be Gunner, it'd be Rutch, it'd be Santander and like a Ryan O'Hearn. Don't particularly want to play an Aaron Hicks here tonight at 2,900 since he's outfield eligible. Uh, I'd rather just play O'Hearn. He's first and outfield eligible. Um, and he's 2,800 and he's hitting in the four hole. So, you know, I'd rather just do that. But uh, just short stacks here, I think, for the O's here tonight uh, against Barrios because, you know, at 8,600, I, I, is he in play? Yeah, maybe, I guess, mostly just because of the price tag. And he does still have a pretty damn good split here with the sinker-slider combo. Um, Four-seamer has actually been serviceable, so he's not nearly as attackable as Bassett last night. So that probably puts him a bit more in play. Um, but overall, mostly lukewarm. It's still a pretty difficult lineup to get after here with Baltimore. Average strikeout rate against right-handed pitching, a little bit above average from an offensive perspective. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, 33% hard, buck 80 ISO, 106 WRC+. Plus. And with Gunner, not a total corpse in the bottom half of the lineup anymore, um, you know, he's going to make this lineup, he's going to help turn it over quite a bit uh, here at the top and, and get some guys on base, even though they did just lose a Ryan Mountcastle, for example. He's got vertigo. Um, you know, they're going to have to piece some things together. So, uh, you know, kind of lukewarm on it here with, uh, with Josie at 8,600. Not super jacked about the price tag, um, but I think he's in play if you land on it. Not going to go out of my way, though. Kyle Bradish on the mound for the O's. 6,200. The price tag puts him in play, but the arsenal and the underlying metrics here, I, eh, maybe not. Um, I do like the hard contact figures here, sub 30% to both sides. I don't like the soft contact figures, 11% in aggregate, 14% to the lefties, 8% to the righties. He's always been attackable a bit more so with the right-handers, and... He's really throwing a two-seamer cutter here. Neither of these are whiff pitches. Cutter, he's throwing a lot to the right side of the plate, and it kind of tails over the barrel a little bit. We talked about this in the past. This is not a same-handed pitch that you that you want to be using uh, unless it's very hard and you can locate it very well. Um, not so much with Kyle Bradish. It, overall, it's a pretty underwhelming pitch to the left side of the plate. This is where you want to be using this pitch. However, he's got the two-seamer. And to opposite-handed hitters, you don't really want to be doing that. So he's got kind of a fishy fastball mix that makes him a little bit susceptible um, to some contact and to some production. And that's why we see elevated average allowed figures here, 271 to the left side and 270 to the right. He's pretty neutral split because he's doing this with both of these fastballs throwing too much of the two seamer to lefties and too much of the cutter to righties. And that's not a good, um, kind of arsenal split or usage split. I should say same thing with the change up throws it a little bit more 10, 15% to the left side, but it's not all that great because it's just a two seamer that he's using here. It's very, very hard as well. Just a five mile an hour velo Delta. So kind of a fishy change up. He's also throwing this slider exceptionally hard relative to the velocity of his fastballs. 88 mile an hour slider with just 95 in the tank on the fastballs is very, very hard. So basically what this is, is it's kind of like a slider and a cutter hybrid pitch. And when he's throwing this to righties, he doesn't induce a lot of swing and miss. That's why we see a reduced strikeout rate to the right side, 21% here, when this should be given this value that he's eking out of the slider, he should be getting a lot more whiffs, right? Should be a lot higher number in the strikeout department. But he gives up a little bit more power, as I mentioned, throwing the cutter in a very hard slider here. It doesn't break as much as it needs to in order to induce whiffs. So you see the lower or higher contact numbers and lower strikeout rate. No soft contact, right? So this is all kind of coming together Curveball is where he's really getting most of his whiffs, and he's got a 28% CSW, which is an incredible figure for a guy that's really only got kind of break-even and overall pretty unimpressive stuff. The CSW I really like. I think it's in here for Bradish. He just has to he has to work out the usage a little bit more, throw less of the cutter to righties, and pretty much just get rid of the two-seamer. He's got to move this over to a four-seamer. Uh, or just dial in the value and work on the location with the cutter against righty so he doesn't tail it over the barrel. Um, 
That said, what mostly worries me here with Kyle Bradish, not the price tag, right? 6,200 is a playable figure for him. Certainly sub 3% ownership is a very playable figure there as well. It's the strike one rate, 54%, really leaving it on the table, and it has prevented him from going deep into games here. So despite a five-pitch arsenal that can be equitable and serviceable for him, he throws too many pitches, and he throws... Like it's not, it doesn't translate into walks necessarily, but it's getting ahead early in counts, allowing him to work to the good breaking stuff. That's really preventing deeper uh, value for him in terms of um, in terms of depth in the game. Right, only 80, 85 pitches here per outing, and that's just not enough. Even at 6,200 here, it's certainly not against Toronto uh, in a down matchup. Right, 21% aggregate K rate, buck 14 WRC plus. 34% hard contact, 170 ISO starting to tick up here a little bit as we get into the summer and these guys start seeing the baseball a little bit more. So I think this matchup for Toronto tonight is far more attackable. And I would like to get to some Brewers a little bit, I think. Some of these lefties here I think are in a, a pretty decent spot despite a slightly elevated strikeout rate to the left side for them. Hard contact rate. Hovering right at 30%, that's attackable. It's mostly the line drive rate here that I want to get to with the lefties. 27% to the left side, that's Dalton Varsho. And even like a Kevin Biggio, he's been seeing the baseball a little bit better. Came off the bench last night and hit a bomb. Um, Kevin Kiermaier should be back. I think he was dealing with like an oblique or got hit in the ribs or you know something. I can't keep all this stuff straight. 2400 for him in a wraparound. I think that's okay. It makes Springer, Bichette, Vladdy, and Matt Chapman far more attainable to get to. I want to stay off of Whit Merrifield. I think he stinks, doesn't have any power. And unfortunately, he's just kind of an anchor right there in the middle of the lineup, an anchor in the negative sense, because he doesn't have any upside. Um, when he's not getting on base and stealing bases, he's literally just a free out. So despite him being dual eligible at second base and, and outfield at 3,600 in the five hole. I really don't want to play him. Um, and I really don't want to be playing like an Alejandro Kirk either. He's got uh, very little upside. They did activate Danny Jansen at 3,400. He's a fine catcher play fly ball hitter there. So um, I think some Toronto stacks, you could convince me that they are um, pretty equitable here tonight. They're kind of middling sort of in, in, I mean, outside of the top three, four guys or whatever in price tag, because you got the, the cheaper guys down at the bottom that you can get to. Uh, so I think Toronto is a, a pretty decent stack here. I'm less enthused with the O's tonight than I was yesterday. Uh, but still, Gunner, Rutch, Santander, Ryan O'Hearn certainly in play. Okay, let's move on to Garrett Cole and Justin Verlander. I don't know, man. I think Garrett Cole's overpriced. Um, 11,000. I like, look at these numbers here. These are average figures. He's outperforming his strand rate by a few ticks, his career strand rate by a few ticks. That's going to regress. Can it continue to come down? He's got a 280 ERA with expected metrics, a run, run and a half higher nearly. Buck 15 whip is fine because he's not giving up a lot of average still. Um, but the strikeout rate's down to 26%. He solved the homer problem, what you know, seemingly for the most part. And he's not giving up uh, one every damn start or even north of that anymore. But he sacrificed a lot of the K stuff in order to make that happen. So, um, I don't know. I think Garrett Cole at 11,000, he's still Garrett Cole. He still has upside for 40 anytime he takes the mound. But does he really? It's a lot of strike one still. So, he's still very efficient there. Good chase. Fine 11% swinging strike rate. But honestly, if I'm paying... 11,000, or I'm paying anything for a starting pitcher, and just going after a 28% CSW with an 11% swinging strike rate, I would rather, we'll go back to Kyle Bradish here, or, uh, yeah, Kyle Bradish here real quick, he's got an 11% swing strike rate and a 28% CSW himself, and he's 4,800 cheaper, so if those are the only two metrics we're, we're going by, um, Garrett Cole's just flat overpriced, he of course has better strikeout upside but this is just as bad a strikeout matchup against the Mets. It's even worse, in, as a matter of fact, for Garrett Cole, um, you know, than it is for freaking Bradish against Toronto, right? So 102 WRC plus here for the Mets. They don't create or anything. It's a bad offense. Don't get me wrong. But they still don't strike out because they're sticky. They're missing Pete Alonso still. And that would put me onto Garrett Cole a little bit more because Pete Alonso doesn't really strike out. He's a damn good power hitter. Um, 
So sure, if you want to land on some Garrett Cole, he's 13% owned here. That does attract me a little bit. But for the most part, I'm not impressed with these numbers. I think there's more negative regression coming for Cole. He's just going to be average. Like, where's the value on the breaking pitches? It's not there. Where's the value on the changeup? It's just not there. Four-seamer's still very good, of course, but he's not getting ground balls anymore. He's a neutral, and he's a fly ball pitcher. So I don't want to deal with this at this price tag necessarily. I'm still just going to leave him on the shelf for the most part. Have a little bit of coverage, I guess, but... Even at 15%, like, I don't want to try and get leverage here on the field. I don't think the matchup warrants that. And I'm not impressed with these with these figures. Like, I think we're seeing late career Garrett Cole. And similar to, like, Verlander on the other side, like, the, the numbers are just, they're dropping off the table here uh, quite, quite precipitously. So I think he's overpriced. And I'd rather get to some other guys here today that have far, far more consistency and upside in the tank, I think. Justin Verlander for them, um, or for the Mets, rather, 8000 I think this is a damn good price tag. First of all, this is the cheapest we've seen him since 2016. Um, now, I, I understand that he's you know, 68 years old here and still trying to throw into big leagues. Um, but 8000 still for Verlander, historically, like he's still got some kind of noise in numbers here. He's had a lot of bad matchups and difficult matchups that are keeping the strikeout number down, right? He's just at 20%, but he's had Tampa, he's had Cleveland, he had Colorado at Coors Field, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think those down matchups, he had Atlanta, and his, yeah, they strike out, but that's a very potent offense. Um, it, he's had some hard hard spots to get through. So I think there's still noise. We mentioned this in his last start before he got blown apart by Atlanta. Um that I, that we're looking for some positive regression for Verlander here. What really concerns me is the strike one rate, right? 55% so far this season, really struggling with the command. And historically, Verlander has had an impeccable walk rate. It's been 3%, 5% at most of his career. So um, that's really a little bit concerning here. Not throwing it past people deeper in the count. Always had a very good curveball, which he's struggling to find value with so far as well. So there's some underlying kind of question marks, and that's mostly because, well, he's old, right? And the guy in his freaking 40s, you know, he's not going to be able to be elite his entire career, especially when he had a, you know, very significant surgery um, this late in his career. That said, 8000 is a very attainable price tag, and I like that the ownership is actually kind of drift downward, starting to drift downward. As we get into some more uh, solid ownership figures here today across the industry. So 20, 25% ownership on Verlander. I think it's okay. Uh, but mostly it's price tag here. And I think this is an attainable matchup against the Yankees. Because Stanton and Donaldson there. They're going to strike out. Jake Bauer's going to whiff. Um, guys at the top of the like They let off Jake Bowers last night. Like I don't know what we're doing here. I mean, sure, it's against Scherzer or whatever. They're probably not going to do that tonight since Verlander historically doesn't have as pronounced a split. Um, but even Scherzer, he got picked apart mostly by the right-handers again last night, even though we mentioned that he's, you know, we probably just want the lefties, at least you do historically. Verlander, his splits historically are not as pronounced. Um, but we're worried about the, the K stuff here and the strike one rate. That's really the only question mark, I think. Overall, I think he's got... He's never thrown a changeup a lot. He's mainlined mostly just a four-seamer slider curveball here with kind of a show-me change that he mixes in. Um, it's still Verlander, and he's very cheap, and he's had an attainable ownership figure here. Uh, in the mid-range, I'm not overly comfortable with playing a lot of guys here tonight. I think everybody's really got holes, to be quite honest. And... I don't know, maybe you could save some money and just not deal with the Verlander shenanigans against what's still a respectable lineup. However, this is at City Field, big ballpark, and I think that plays into his favor a little bit. Still looking for that positive regression, not so much necessarily in the suppression metrics, um, but the strain rate, this is going to come up for Verlander. This is exceptionally low for him, and the strikeout rate, and we expect the strike one rate to come up as well. So this is a fine matchup for him. It's just kind of average matchup, but I think it's an okay spot for him to kind of get off the schneid here a little bit. And I'm going to have some Verlander, not sure how much, but like this projection and value score here is kind of hard to ignore at this particular price tag. 
So I'm really mostly off of the Yankees. Um, you want to play some cheap guys? Yeah, sure, go ahead. You can target Verlander. I, I think that's fine because of the strike one rate and the low strikeout rate so far this season. Mostly off of the Mets, though. Um, Nimmo's okay. Again, I don't really, I still don't want to go after Garrett Cole. I still respect the arm, even though I think he's just average and there's just cheaper guys that I'd probably prefer to get to, um, anymore. Frankie Lindor's fine, 47. Frankie Alvarez, yeah, I mean, sure, at, at 40 or 3,800. Brandon Nimmo, that's probably the three men I'd play. Uh, but overall, it's probably just going to miss the cut for me. Okay, let's move on to Colorado and Boston. Really interesting game here once again tonight. Now, of the last couple of games with Colorado and Boston, I think tonight is where I really want to jump on board with the Red Sox. Um, there's been, you know, some underlying metrics that have suggested that both Connor Siebold and whoever the hell started last night, uh, Chase Anderson, you know, could suppress some production from the Red Sox. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened here tonight with Austin Gomber. I don't think this is really reasonable. Uh, a lot of his, his numbers here are certainly inflated because most of his appearances have come at Coors Field this season. However, it's contact rates and, you know, just typical converging metrics that we like to look at. Strike one rate's fine, but it's a chase rate, 22%, 10% walk rate, 14% strikeout rate, 10% barrel rate, and hard contact rates north of 36% to both sides, 37% in aggregate here so far this season that are really worrisome for me. I do think a 5,100 price tag puts him in play because he's still a major league arm and he's 5,100 and he could pop for 15 points and that could be serviceable, right? However, I'm not even going to chase that. Um, you could have convinced me to play some Chase Anderson or some Connor Siebold in the last couple of nights, even though their projections have been basically identical to Austin Gombers here today over the last couple of nights. Um, here tonight, you probably have a lit, little bit harder time uh, convincing me to jump on the Austin Gomber train. Um, you know, the, yeah, the the power numbers and and realized ERA seven and a half with a five twenty five xbit. Yeah, like there's noise here because of the Coors Field shenanigans. Um, and if you want to land on, if you do land on a fifty one hundred, like nobody's gonna want to do this. Uh, you'd probably be able to convince me on that metric alone. But, like, if we look at fundamentals here, every single number is going to tell you to stay the hell away and get to Boston. So I think I'd probably just rather do that tonight um, and play some of these right-handers. But, like, I'll play lefties too. Like, Devers, as we talked about, like, he's heating up. He had two bombs last night. So give me a Rob Ref Snyder at 2,600. He might lead off. Give me Justin Turner again, 3,800. I think that's fine. Adam Duvall, really like this play here tonight. 5,100 heavy fly ball hitter and against right-handers this year, Gomber's got a slight ground ball lean. Still giving up a lot of power though and a lot of average really to both sides. Noisy to the lefties, whatever, 62 hitters. But 216 hitters against right-handers this year is not noisy. 303 average allowed, 397 Woba with a 261 ISO. 36% hard. Yeah, let's do it. It's line drive rates that are really very attackable here, and this is still a hitter's ballpark, even though you might have to deal with a little bit of cooler weather tonight in Boston and some showers or, or whatever it is. Uh, I think they're very much in play against Austin Gomber. So let's uh, let's get to pretty much everybody, top to bottom. I think you can play the entire lineup tonight. I'm okay with getting to them. And it's a 12-game slate. We're not going to have to worry all that much about ownership necessarily since there are some other teams in some really good spots too. So of the three games so far in this series, I think tonight is the one where I really want to jump on board with Boston. And they might see lower ownership than they probably should tonight because uh, a lot of the field has been burned in the last couple of nights outside of the Devers last night. Garrett Whitlock on the mound. He's popping really hard in the in the numbers so far, the projections. Not so much in the fundamentals. Um, I think this is a little fishy to be quite honest. I want to get to a little bit of Colorado again. I think full five stacks are very much in play here tonight for the Rockies. Um, it's mostly going to be like an a Zeke Tovar, Ryan McMahon, Elias Diaz, Nolan Jones, and any one of a Randall Gritchick, Moustakis at 2,900. It's kind of gross uh, at first base only. Or Brenton Doyle. Um, we'll see what they want to do, but 
I think full Rockies five stacks are in play here tonight. Garrett Whitlock, I respect this arm. I think it's in the tank for him. He's got really good plate discipline numbers. Doesn't walk anybody. Sub 5% walk rate. 76, 77% strike one is elite. 35% chase is elite. 12% swinging strikes. 18% called strikes. 29%, 30% CSW is fantastic, right? Everything is great there. But where's the swing and miss, right? Just a 20% strikeout rate. Where's the swing and miss? And that's mostly because he's thrown a two-seamer that is a bad pitch. He doesn't have a four-seamer. doesn't throw a cutter. He should because he's got, he throws a slider. But he only throws the two-seam fastball, and he uses it a lot here. So he throws this against left-handed hitters, and that translates into some power. 228 average ISO allowed. 21% strikeout rate. The two-seamer is not a strikeout pitch. It's not a whiff pitch. 36% hard contact. Sub-16% soft. And a neutral ground ball to fly ball. So that, with this mixture here, bad two-seamer, changeup's going to be bad too, throws this 25% of the time, right? So with that, you should split. Um, he's going to be very susceptible to left-handed hitters, and there's no whiffs. So I think you can get to, this is a short sample, don't get me wrong. But with the perhaps outsized plate discipline numbers a little bit, um, and just a three-pitch arsenal here, I think that's attackable. And I think you really play both sides here. I like the price tag on Whitlock. I don't like the matchup uh, because the Rockies against right-handed pitching, this is an okay team. This 89 WRC+, plus, it's ticking up, right? It's been 80, it was 88, I think, yesterday, as a matter of fact. Probably because they put up seven runs is why this number is climbing. But 22% strikeout rate, this is this is ticking down. Right, it was 22 and a half in the last couple of days. Eight percent walk rates, average buck 50 ISO. It's average, not all that impressive, of course. 3.26 wOBA and a 33 percent hard, all average here. But what's really attractive is the 25 percent line drive rate for a team aggregate. 1800 PA's split adjusted. This is three percent above average. Three percent for a team aggregate. That is a monstrous, monstrous figure. You do not see this over huge samples like this all that often. This is a super difficult lineup to get through when you give up a lot of line drives. And in particular, I want to get to some of these righties here. Even though I really like McMahon and Nolan Jones, give me Zeke Tovar at 3,300, give me Elias Diaz at 45, and maybe a Randall Gritchick or a Brenton Doyle because Whitlock's got a 31% line drive rate to the right side of the plate. I really think this is attackable. Pushing a 200 ISO here, 343 average allowed so far in a short sample, yeah. But to the right-handers, these are big numbers, and it's not because he's walking people. Look at the WOBA, 385 to righties, very much in play are full Rocky stacks here because Ryan McMahon got a price drop, 4,600. I like this a lot, still really seeing the baseball. Nolan Jones hit a bomb, or damn near a bomb last night. If he hits this out in any, most any other ballpark than Boston... Like he hit the 420 sign in the in the little in the crook out there in center field. So um, I think I think Colorado's very much in play here, and they've got a total north of four in the last couple of games. They've had a total south of that. So um, despite a very attractive price tag and very attractive projection and value scores here for Whitlock, I love the plate discipline. I don't like the barrel rate. I don't like the line drive rate against the right side. And I think this two-seamer changeup mix against lefties is super, super attackable. Uh, so I want to go after it. And I think the Rockies are very much in play. Very rare that I'm going to say that on a full 12-game slate outside of Coors Field. Uh, but Fenway is a hitter's ballpark, too. And I want to go after this. I think this is very much in play. That said... Given the price tag and the very low ownership on Whitlock, he's also in play with these plate discipline numbers. Not so much upside in, in terms of strikeouts, but um, you know, price tag mostly is what puts him in play. Boston, of course, we're going to get to everybody, and and I like the Rockies here too as a really cool tournament stack. Okay, let's move on. LA, uh, the Angels and Texas. Reed Detmer's on the mound. I cannot figure this guy out, man. Like, how does he do it? He has a four seamer slider. Fly ball mix here, does not throw a changeup. When he does throw it, it gets torched. And he's got a break-even curveball. Like, where the hell is all this swing and miss against the right side of the plate coming from? Like, he's got a break-even four-seamer, break-even slider, and a bad change. 
and a break even curveball. How does he strike out 29% of lefty or right handers? I do not understand it. He's a fly ball pitcher with 39% hard contact. How does he do it? So I can't figure it out. Um, I, I still got to do a, a even deeper dive on him. I mean, I know the, the, that he's got back foot whiffs to right handers with a slider. I know that he's got buried whiffs with the curveball here. But where's the value on them? You know, to same handed hitters, like if he if his slider is this good against opposite handed hitters and it suppresses this much power, it should be good against lefties too, and it's really not. It never has been. Right? So he's been a little bit of a reverse split guy in terms of suppression the last couple seasons, and this is why every time he's on the mound, I said, yeah, let's stack against Reed Detmers because of this damn hard contact number. This has been this high for two freaking seasons. I don't understand with just an 080 ground ball to fly ball here how he doesn't give up more power. Um, so, like, I mean, if you guys got the answers, yeah, let me know. But uh, I want to go after this again, and this is Texas. So, sure, unfortunately for Texas today, if you want to get to a lot of them, they've seen... 15 and 20% price bumps kind of across the board. Semyon back up to 6,100. Corey Seager up over 6,000. I talked about that yesterday. Like, he was 53 and he hit a bomb and now he's 6,000 the next day. Like, well, unfortunately, um, you know, that's kind of what we got to deal with. Nate Lowe up to 46 from 4,000 yesterday. Adelise Garcia is still 55. Josh Young back up to 48, though. And both Jonah Heim and Mitch Garver have seen price increases as well. Zeke Duran, Leody, Tavares down at the bottom. They'll make it a little bit cheaper for you. So these guys are not cheap. And Reed Deppers might be able to strike out some of these right-handers here. I mean, Adelise Garcia, he'll, he'll strike out a little bit. Josh Young's still going to strike out from the right side. Semi and maybe not so much, but hard to get really thrilled about paying these, these price tags for a full stack here against Texas. I'm still going to do it because I love Texas. I love the lineup. I love the versatility. Um... And they're really going to be kind of off the board. It's the price tags that are keeping them down in ownership so far. So I want to play some if I can make it happen. I don't want to play even a 7,000 slightly attractive price tag with Reed Detmers with a nice K-rate split here. I don't like the hard contact numbers. I don't like the walk rate. I love the barrel rate. Yeah, don't get me wrong, sub 5%. Um, but I, I think he's very attackable here with this arsenal. I I think the pitches are, are just marginal at best. And hard contact is way below par for me. So uh, no thank you when to read Detmers uh, against Texas. Andrew Heaney on the mound for the Rangers, 8,400. Eh, I think the price tag's a little bit fishy here in this matchup. Um, now, he's got the four-seamer, which is not nearly as bad as it's been in the past. It's about break even for him and even positive value a little bit eking about a quarter of an out above the field uh, out of this pitch. 58, 60%, still throws it a ton, but he's mixing in a lot more of the changeup now. Um, and this is basically a break-even pitch for him, too. Eight mile an hour velo delta, it's fine. The whole arsenal with the break-even slider, it's not all that impressive, right? He's actually throwing far less of the slider this season and moved a lot of the usage over the changeup. So this has made him far more serviceable, and he doesn't give up near as much power as he used to. Just a 206 ISO, even though this is north of 200 and a huge figure, it's not the 300 ISO that he's given up in the past past couple seasons, right, to the right side of the plate. Above average strikeout stuff to both sides. Of course, he's been very good in the whiff department against lefties, 29% there, 24% though against right-handers. Walk rate far lower, noisy sample, just 42 hitters against lefties, kind of whatever. But just a 32% hard contact rate. This is a you know, mostly a league average figure here anymore for Andrew Heaney. He still gets on the barrel a little bit at a full 10%, and that's because the four-seamer and the changeup are not all that great. And he doesn't really have a, a wipeout breaking pitch that he can keep right-handers off balance with. So that's a little bit concerning. Overall, an elevated 10% walk rate, elevated 10% barrel rate. But for the most part, he's been far more serviceable this year. That makes him playable in a lot of good matchups. I'm not sure the Angels here tonight are all that good a matchup. Taylor Ward uh, has been pretty decent recently, even though he kind of shit the bed last night. Shohei's been fantastic. You can play him against everybody. He's kind of getting into Shohei mode. Uh, Mike Trout, he got a day off yesterday. He's 6,000. Uh, this is a fine spot for him uh, against... Andrew Heaney, who's still going to give up a little bit of pop. Anthony Rendon doesn't really have all that much pop anymore. 3,300, though, in the three-hole or, or the four-hole, probably. 
um, at third base. It's fine. Brandon Drury, he might be out tonight because he got suspended for touching an umpire the other night. Um, so keep an eye on that. Hunter Renfro hit a bomb last night. Hopefully he starts to heat back up again. That was nice to see. Luis Renjifo with a flat zero. He would be in there probably at uh, maybe second base if, um, if Brandon Drury is out tonight. So keep an eye on what they want to do down at the bottom of the lineup. Against the lefty, Chad Wallach, in a short sample this season, has hit lefties pretty well since they've given him some more at-bats you know, in the platoon with Matt Dice. Uh, Zach Neto, like, he's been great too. Hit another bomb last night. He's got, what, three or four in the last week. So playable Angel stack kind of off the board here against Andrew Heaney and attacking a little bit of susceptibility here in the power allowed to right-handers. Um, probably just short stacks for me, though. I'm not jacked about playing Zach Neto shortstop uh, on a full 12-game slate, to be quite honest. But there's plenty of power here from the other guys in the top half. And even Luis Renjifo, he hits right-handers, or excuse me, left-handers from the right side exceptionally well, and he's 2,200. So um, I think the Angels are in play. That's probably going to take me off of Heaney a little bit at 8,400. I think it's a little fishy of a price tag. But undoubtedly, he has strikeout upside and if he's totally off the board, as he appears to be so far, at sub-5% ownership, I think this makes him a really intriguing tournament play. So mostly just offense for me here in, in Texas. But I like the Angels a little bit, too. No Reed Detmers, maybe a little bit of heating. Okay, Pittsburgh, Chicago. Should have better weather here tonight. Um, you know, we talked about this. If they were going to play the game, you could see the baseball fly a little bit. And sure enough, Cubs got to Luis Ortiz. Um, might be able to see a little bit of a similar outcome here for Chicago tonight, but perhaps a little bit for Pittsburgh as well. Uh, now, Pittsburgh's got a young-ish arm coming up and making his debut. Uh, this is Osvaldo Bito. Uh, he's coming up from AAA. He spent the last three seasons in AAA, and he's got respectable numbers, nothing overly impressive, uh, but he will be making his debut. And this season, let's see, he's got uh, about a 4.5 ERA that's really persisted over the last couple of years with pretty decent sample size at AAA. Um, 165, 170 innings in AAA in total and about a 4.5 ERA, give or take. Whip this year is down compared to last year. It was buck fifty last year, buck thirty this year, so that's attractive. 13.5% swinging strike rate, 23.5% K rate. However, slightly elevated 11% walk rate. So we don't really want to be going after that necessarily, but average exit velo is elite here at 84 miles an hour. Very good figure there. Just a 27% stat cast hard hit rate, and that's attractive. Uh, so it might take you off of some of the Cubs here, um, and I think that's okay. However, it's still a young arm and a AAA guy that's got – an 11% walk rate with a 4.5 ERA in AAA. So this is still the Cubs. They may be heating up a little bit. Last night could very well serve to get their offense going. And I think they're at very playable price tag. Still 2800 for talk leading off. That's fine. Let's say Suzuki is back. He's at 37. Like that a good bit. Ian Happ, sure, at 4100. Let's do it. Dansby. At 51, that's fine. Chris Morell hit another bomb last night. He's at 46 in the six hole. It's kind of intriguing price tag there. Matt Mervis, 25, and on down the list. They're very playable against a um, what's overall a kind of a soft tossing righty or average tossing righty uh, from Pittsburgh here in Beto. So uh, he's not in the DK player pool. That's why we don't have him in the sheet at all. So you can't really play him or take shots on him. So I'd rather just get to the Cubs anyway. Drew Smiley on the mound for Chicago. 7,200 is an intriguing price tag here, and he's been pretty respectable so far this season. Um, however, I still want to take shots against him, and I think tonight with the Pirates is a decent opportunity. I got some righties over here, notably a Kutch, Reynolds, Connor Joe, Cabrian Hayes, Rody Castro, that hit left-handers pretty well. He's just a three-pitch guy, basically a two-and-a-half-pitch guy. Uses the cutter against right-handers a good bit. Not so much against lefties, and he doesn't throw it all that much in, in aggregate. So just a 7.5% usage pitch for him. It's been fine, um, but still mostly just confident in the two-seamer and the curveball. Two-seamer, I don't like this pitch, though. I, I'm going to rant about this literally every single day. Against opposite-handed hitters, it it's not a strikeout pitch, and when it floats, it floats, and it goes over the wall. And that's why we see a very high, or very low, rather, ground ball to fly ball ratio at 065 
lot of fly balls, and it's really the curveball that, that keeps all of the righties off balance and keeps teams popping balls up. He induces a lot of soft contact with that pitch. 24% against right-handers, 26% hard contact. That's super attractive. But he doesn't have a lot of whiffs, right, because he just throws the sinker, and the cutter, not necessarily a whiff pitch either. Right, so he's trying to induce soft fly balls against the right side and pop-ups and soft contact, and he accomplishes that pretty well. Um, however, against lefties, you know, like I mentioned, they got a lot of right-handed hitters that hit lefties pretty well. So I think I'm going to take some shots with Pittsburgh tonight. I like these price tags. Connor Joe in particular, 3,400. He'll be in, in probably the three-hole. Uh, Carlos Santana hits from both sides. He's been a little, you know, a little bit respectable this season, to be honest. Brian Hayes, I like at 4,100. Been seeing the baseball pretty well recently. Rody Castro, you have to be careful with him. He's got dual eligibility, and he's a switch hitter, technically. He's a 3,400. It's a playable price tag, but he is dreadful from the left side of the plate. So when they bring in a righty later on in the game, he may very well. Like, they've actually pinch hit for him a couple of times, even though he can hit from the left side. He is awful. So you really want him from the right side. The numbers are, are significantly better um, against left-handers for him. And you can play Kutch and, and Reynolds, of course, at the top of the lineup as well. So I want to get to some really sneaky Pittsburgh stacks here. Uh, they're totally off the board. I think Smiley is in play. I like the price tag here for him, and I really like the ownership, to be honest. Um, he's got strikeout stuff against lefties, but yeah, whatever. Not so much against the right side. So I think there's going to be a little bit more contact in general. He pitches to a 79% contact rate. And Pirates, are they're probably going to roll out at least eight righties here tonight. It might be a full nine. Um, so we'll see what the Pirates want to do with the lineup. But I like getting to them a little bit here. And unfortunately, we're not going to get a lot of leverage uh, against Smiley. So I think that puts him in play. But I think Pittsburgh and Chicago's offenses are both in play as well. Okay, let's move on to Washington and Houston. JoJo Gray on the mound for the Nationals. 6600 is a fine price tag for JoJo. However, I just can't do it with the high walk rate here against lefties. Now, there's only going to be one lefty in the list. It's, it'll be Kyle Tucker. Um, but this is Kyle Tucker, and I still don't want to go after that. Now, he's much better against righties, but he gives up more power to them. right? 187 ISO here because he still throws a four-seamer and a little bit of the cutter to the right side of the plate. Now, the usage is overall pretty good. JoJo is making progress here in his, what, fourth season in the bigs, something like that. Um, excuse me. But the strike one rate is really leaving it on the table still, and it doesn't translate to a lot of whiffs for him. And he has trouble, like, throwing strikes deeper into count and, and working to the plus breaking stuff that he does have. The fastball mix isn't really all that equitable, and it's still a question mark for him. He's got a very high strand rate here, 85%. 3-0 ERA with expected metrics a run and a half and two runs higher than that. I think JoJo is is due to get really blown apart here at some point, and it, it may not come tonight because he still induces a lot of ground balls to the right side and, and induces a lot of soft contact. He's really sor solved the hard contact issues that have plagued him in the past, but he's still giving up a little bit of pop and only a 17.5% strikeout rate to the right side. As we said, the, the Astros are going to go very right-handed heavy here tonight just because they have to. The only lefty that's going to be in there is going to be Kyle Tucker. That's it. Um, they don't even have anybody else on their freaking active roster, so they don't have a choice. Um, attainable price tags here, too, for Houston. I'm kind of lukewarm on it, though. I do like the soft contact. I do like the ground balls that JoJo induces. I don't really want to play him, don't get me wrong, because I think this is super dangerous, and this is still a really good offense over here. So you may want to jump on board tonight after they kind of disappointed against Patrick Corbin. Um, I think it's fine, because Josie Altuve is 45, Bregman's 45, Tucker's still 5,000. Sure, go ahead. I don't want to play Jose Abreu. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, Jeremy Pena down to 44, finally, seeing his price tag come down. Um Jolks is 27. McCormick hit a bomb last night at 3,000. Mo Dubon's not going to strike out. He also hit a bomb last night somehow. Second and outfield eligibility there. So you can play both Dubon and El Tuve. So I like Houston stacks a little bit here. Um, I think they're kind of down the board, at least in ownership so far, popping a little bit in value. So I think they're attractive somewhat, but I wouldn't be surprised if JoJo still just kind of suppresses a little bit because he induces so much soft contact. 
Uh, Framber on the mound for the Astros. I want to get to a little bit of this, but I'm not sure, man. Like, this changeup has me really, really worried. Uh, he's throwing it less now over the last several starts because maybe he's realized finally that it's a terrible pitch for him. Not getting any value. Still staying down in the strike zone, but the strikeout stuff has dropped off a full ground ball per fly ball compared to last season. He was at a 4-0 ratio. He's down under 3. Now, under 3 is still, you know, top 1% in the elite ground ball to fly ball stuff. But the, the line drive stuff is still there. And the changeup value here, he just, he's, it's a meatball changeup for the most part against right-handers here. And these guys from Washington are not going to strike out all that much. The strikeout stuff for Framber is also down six and seven ticks compared to last season. Could be dealing with a little bit of the, the change in the baseball, not allowing him to really dial in this changeup. Um, so I'm okay with this at 10-3. I think it's fine. It's a fine suppression matchup, of course. But I'm a little concerned with some underlying, certainly with the whiff stuff against opposite-handed hitters. Um, now, he's still not allowing a lot of power, right? Still getting a boatload of ground balls. But look at this hard contact rate, 39% to the right side. They've got some guys over here at Washington that will hit left-handers really well. Lane Thomas, in particular, I like this price tag for him. At 4,200 up at the top, Joey Manessis is fine at 34. He'll, I mean, his power numbers have, have definitely dropped off in his second year in the bigs, but he's in a playable 3,400. Stone Garrett I like as well at 2,800, excuse me. Alex Call has some pop against lefties also. Um, so mostly just like a short sort of leverage stack against 20, 25% ownership that Framber is going to see tonight. It's a good suppression spot. I want to get to a little bit of this if I can. Um, but he's certainly not my favorite arm on the day, I'll tell you that much, even though the projection is very high. I'd probably rather play Kershaw, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd rather play Kershaw, even though Kershaw gets a, a harder strikeout, ma or a harder, um, you know, platoon matchup, I would say, than Framber. And, I mean, it's pretty close between the two guys. We'll get to Kershaw later. So I'm okay with getting to this. I think the ownership figure, as I mentioned at the outset, I don't think it's all that exploitable here. Do you want to come in a little bit over? Probably not. Do you want to come in a little bit under? He's kind of risky because Framber still has 40 in the tank, even in this down strikeout matchup. He could go a full eight innings, strike out five or whatever, and not give up any production. And that's that's perfectly within range here against Nationals. They are a dreadful offense. But not so much against left-handers, right? 115 WRC+, plus, 17% strikeout rate, no hard contact, well below average power, but an okay line drive rate. So I think a couple of these guys are in play. Framber also in play. Um, I'd side with Framber, of course, but you know, perhaps maybe not as much as the industry necessarily. Um, if I had to choose, I'd probably just come in under on this and feel okay with 15% of my teams and Framber Valdez, with Framber Valdez exposure. Easy for me to say. Okay, so um, let's move on. But uh, I, like, I like Framber. I like Houston a little bit there. Maybe a JoJo if you land on it, but this is like a super gulpy spot. And some Washington pieces. Okay, Cincinnati and the Royals. 6,800 for Ben Lively. I like this. I, li I like this a good good bit here. He's had a couple of difficult matchups where he struggled twice against uh, St. Louis in particular. Um... This is not St. Louis over here, right? This is Kansas City, and they are bad against right-handed pitching. 90, or excuse me, uh, 77 WRC plus had some leftover um, numbers there from the the previous matchup we were discussing. 25% strikeout rate, still some hard contact, 35%, but below average power and in, in sub 150 ISO here. 287 wOBA, it's not good, right? Neutral ground ball to fly ball, they pop up a lot of balls here, so. Overall, they don't create a lot. They've only got one guy, basically, with speed, and that's Bobby Witt. Um, he's 50, what, 5,700 here today? I, I like, come on. Uh, he's still a little bit expensive. I like getting to Ben Live. He's got six pitches here. I like the hard contact numbers, sub-30% to both sides. I really like the soft contact number against right-handers. It's going to neutralize the best hitters over here, Salvi and Bobby Witt. He's going to have to go after these lefties, and he'll give up a little bit of power to them. However, I think we might be dealing with some batted ball noise there because Lively overall has been pretty good, and he's got six pitches here. So I think this is a playable spot for him. 
Um, he's had, what, four or five outings at Great American, and we mentioned a couple of difficult matchups twice against St. Louis. Um, and St. Louis was his last outing, actually, where he got kind of picked apart. Um, but he's still going deep into games. In his five full starts this season, first two appearances were out of the bullpen, he's gone five and two-thirds, six, five and two-thirds, seven, and six and two-thirds. Now, the suppression hasn't totally been there for him, but the strikeout stuff really kind of has been. Eight, eight, six, five, and eight strikeouts in his five starts. So I think it's there. And in this particular matchup, I really want to go after the Royals, even though the strikeout stuff against the lefties is a bit down at 22%. These lefties from Kansas City, they're still going to strike out. Nick Prado, MJ, maybe not so much, but Michael Massey going to strike out. We'll see what they want to do. They might put a, a few more righties in the list, like an Eddie Olivares or Drew Waters, Michael Garcia. He'll probably be in there something like that. So we'll see how they want to structure things. But I think Ben Lively is very much in play. It's mostly because of the very low ownership figure here. I like this a lot going against a dreadful lineup. We've been attacking, attacking the Royals all season with right-handers, and I want to do this, I think. So, um, yeah, give me some Ben Lively at 6,800. I'd probably rather play him than Drew Smiley, I think. Daniel Lynch on the mound for the Royals. I'm not going to do this. Um, I think I want to get to the Reds here once again tonight. Uh, now, I came off of them a little bit last night. It was mostly due to um, Jordan Lyle's price tag. Didn't mention that in the vid, but uh, I did some more digging a little bit, and I thought he could survive. Unfortunately, he had a one bad inning there uh, where the Reds kind of – they put up uh, five in in the second inning, I think. And that kind of cooked his evening. But he was serviceable outside of that. I don't think Daniel Lynch is going to be able to realize the same sort of upside. Historically, he's always given up power to right-handers, a lot more hard contact to right-handers. He's a traditional split guy. Now, he, he has introduced the cutter here, and so far the cutter change in his three starts has been pretty good for him, but he did get Colorado uh, in one of his starts, and that's going to inflate the numbers here. Uh, he also got Washington, who's kind of a dreadful offense as well, and Baltimore, which is a little bit more difficult. Um, but he survived, right? So he's been okay in his first three starts this season. But there, I want to see more from Daniel Lynch. And I think he's a bad matchup. Attacking the Reds here against lefties. 96 WRC+, plus, not all that impressive there. 24% K rate, not all that impressive there. Pa below average power, below average hard contact. But they're going to go very right-handed heavy here tonight. And it's mostly, it's not necessarily the Reds numbers that I'm attracted to. It's fading Daniel Lynch for the most part uh, and taking shots. So give me some Kevin Newman up at the top. He's 2,900. He's got dual eligibility. You're going to probably have to play him at first base, unfortunately. Because if you want to stack the top five here with like a Matt McClain, Johnny India, Ellie De La Cruz, and a Spencer Steer... In order to make the positions work, you'd have to play Kevin Newman at first base, so that kind of stinks. McLean at short, Johnny India at second, and then Ellie De La Cruz at third base with Spencer Steer in the outfield. If you don't want to do that, you can mix in Tyler Stevenson, of course, at 3,700. It's warm in Kansas City. Might have to deal with some pop-up storms, whatever, but um, it will play up offense a little bit. Still a pretty big ballpark. TJ Hopkins is a stone min in the outfield. You could play that. Josie Barrero, 2,200. In the outfield, you could play that. So I think the Reds are very much stackable here and going after Daniel Lynch. And really, they're kind of down the board in ownership here so far. Not popping so hard in the projections. We'll see how this fleshes out throughout the rest of the day. But I think they're a very playable tournament stack. Perhaps a secondary. You could even mainline a, um, a, a full-on Red stack here and go after Daniel Lynch. He's very enigmatic. And his problems are just not being able to settle in quickly enough. So... Uh, I think the Reds here, they've got enough really good young hitters. Johnny India heating up, Ellie, of course, Matt McClain, of course, Spencer Steer, that they could really jump on him in, in the early going here and um, and cut his out in quite short. So I like the Reds pretty much exclusively here. Yeah, I'll have a couple Royals coverage pieces, um, like a like a Michael Massey and a Nick Prado, for example. But outside of that, I don't want to pay 55 for for Salvi or 57 for Bobby Witt. So just give me mostly Ben Lively and the Reds here. Okay, Tampa and Oakland. Man, Oakland has taken two so far from Tampa. What are we doing here? They won like seven straight. Like, give them the AL pennant right now. Tyler Glass now, however, is on the mound for the Rays tonight, and I want to get as much of this as I can. I love this spot for Glass now. Even if he only goes five innings, he could still put up 30 or 35 and strike out 12. 
uh, or 13 in five innings here. Like, this is a killer, killer matchup. I love the strikeout upside for Glasnow here, and I think the ownership figure so far is, is just way too low. Look at this value score, north of 40 for a starting pitcher in the upper nine or mid-9Ks. It's pretty rare that you see that. Um, now, do I think the projection is probably a bit high? Eh, maybe, maybe on a median basis, but this is Oakland, and Tyler Glasnow is still one of the top five strikeout pitchers in baseball. Um, north of 30% so far in just the three starts that he's made this year. He's spraying it a little bit. He's always kind of had this control issue. Um, and he'll get onto a barrel here or there occasionally, but I'm not really worried about that for the most part against Oakland. The only coverage piece I think I'll, I'm going to go out of my way to have tonight is Seth Brown. I play him against pretty much every righty in baseball. 2,800 still playable there. I don't want any Ramon Laureano, who I've been playing you know, a decent bit over the last couple of weeks, at 2700 not in this matchup. Same thing with Ryan Noda at a cheap price tag at first base. I don't want to deal with that. Asturi Ruiz, sure, at 3300 that's okay. But um, he doesn't have a lot of power. This is a very difficult spot for him against Glasnow. So I want to get to as much Glasnow as I can. And I'm. this is, you know, of the guys in the 9Ks and pitchers we talked about so far, uh, this is the one I'm most bullish on tonight. Hopefully he doesn't make me look like an idiot. But uh, I'm going to get as much as I can of Glasnow here tonight. Luis Medina on the other side, I'm probably still not going to do this. Even though a price tag down here makes these guys playable, um, this is Tampa, and I'm just not going to mess with it. If he has a good start and Tampa shits the bed, then you know so be it, whatever. He came out of the bullpen right, as a long reliever in his last start against, um, I forget who it was, but it was uh, Sam Mole that opened for him um, off the top of my head. Let's see if I can... Picked this, yeah, it was against Milwaukee, right? And he was excellent, right? He went five innings, struck out six, just gave up two runs. So that was good. But Tampa is is not Milwaukee. So let's um let's stay off of the Medina again tonight, I think. I'm just not going to deal with it. I don't like a very high walk rate. I don't like a very high barrel rate. I don't like a below average strikeout rate and a below average swinging strike rate. Just 25% CSW here. So no thanks. 47% strike one. This is why I didn't play him in his last start. I don't care that he put up 20 points. It was a little noisy because, number one, he came out of the bullpen. Number two, he got a win out of it. So I think that those outcomes are, are you know, coming out of the bullpen pretty likely. Again, we'll have to keep an eye on it. But a win is also not super likely against Tampa here tonight. So uh, I don't want to deal with any of the loose Medina. Let's get uh, let's get to Tampa again if we can make it happen. They're they're expensive, but give me Wander at 56. He's got a price drop. I like that. Josh Lowe 49. Yeah, kind of stiff. Luke Rayley though, really like him against right-handers. 3600. We'll see where his ownership comes in. He was insanely popular the other night against uh, Caprillion, I believe. Um. So give me some Luke Rayleigh. He was in the three-hole. So we'll see what they want to do with the lineup. Maybe a Frankie Mejia. He's 2,300. And, you know, he hits from both sides. He's historically hit right. He's pretty okay. They did just bring up Riddell Brujan to give him a little bit more run. Not a ton of upside for him necessarily. More of a contact hit uh, hitter and contact bat. But uh, I think you can play righties. I think you can play lefties. You can play pretty much all of Tampa here. So uh, no Oakland for me outside of some Seth Brown and a boatload of glass now. Okay, Philly and Arizona. Ranger Suarez, he's 5,600. If I'm going to play anybody down in the low 5Ks, it's not going to be Luis Medina, right? And it's not going to be Austin Gomber, um, almost certainly. It's probably going to be Ranger Suarez, but I don't really want to do this, man. He gives up a lot of production to right-handers still because he mostly throws just a two-seamer. However, he's mixing in the cutter and mixing in a good usage of the four-seamer this season, which he has not done in the past. So this is going to, you know, spreading this out, this fastball usage, it's going to allow him to survive much better against right-handers. And sure enough, in his last three outings, they've been excellent, to be honest. Um, still kind of getting going and getting back into the swing of things as he was out for quite some time at the early part of the season. You know, it took a, what, a month off or so. Um, but he's got, what, six starts now, and his first three were not great, but his last three have been excellent in some pretty difficult strikeout matchups. And, and contact matchup, surely, against the Mets in at, at City Field. Went six and two-thirds. At Washington, went seven. Didn't strike out anybody in either of those matchups, but, like, whatever. And then he went six against the Dodgers, struck out eight. Like, where the hell did that come from? So, at 5,600, I think he's in play. He's a better arm than this price tag, even though I don't think he's all that much better than this number. 
Um, 36% hard contact still, that's concerning. Buck 70, buck 80 ISO, really. Concerning. He's not going to walk anybody. He's mostly going to stay off of the barrel and try to stay down in the strike zone. He's always been a ground ball pitcher. Two-seamer changeup going to keep him down. He'll try to induce whips and ground balls with the curveball as well. So he's got a serviceable five- and six-pitch arsenal here that he's using, and I think that makes him that puts him in play, certainly at this price tag. Even against a very dangerous list over here in Arizona, we'd want mostly the fly ball and line drive hitters from the right side. They're pretty okay contact-wise, 21% aggregate K rate, 105 WRC+, plus, 34% hard. 166 ISO against lefties, so give me some Lourdes. Uh, I think that's fine at 4,500. Give me some Christian Walker, 4,200. I like that a little bit. And Manny Rivera, Evan Longoria, they did just get a power upside bat uh, behind the plate back. in Carson Kelly, he's 27. Nick Ahmed hits lefties pretty well historically, and he hits a two-seamer exceptionally well. 2,200 for him. Cattell Marte just got a day off yesterday. He'll be back. So they're going to go right-handed heavy here, which kind of takes me off a of Ranger but, you, I mean, I think he's in play at this particular price tag and mega low ownership if you need to get all the way down here and get to an expensive offense. I think that puts him in play, but I like the D-backs too. Merrill Kelly on the on the mound for Arizona, 9600 I, I don't like the price tag, and I'm not super jacked about the matchup. But I love playing Merrill Kelly. I talk about this every start with him when he is not popular, and he's sub-10% ownership as of right now. So, yeah, give me all of it, um, or as much as I can get. I think... A good 15% Merrill Kelly is perfectly warranted here tonight, even uh, against Philly. Now, where I do kind of balk is his 44% hard contact number against the left side. He's got an elevated walk rate at 10%. It's kind of uncharacteristic for Merrill. Barrel rate's fine at, at, at 8%, but the 45% hard against lefties is concerning for sure. Now, he's getting ground balls, so it's not all that concerning, but anything north of 40%, where it's like, we'll oh, time out, guys. You know, with even a... 150 ground ball to fly ball against the lefties, I need this number a hell of a lot higher if I'm going to even consider stomaching 44% hard contact in a platoon. So perhaps a little bit of overperformance there for Merrill so far, given that contact figure. Against lefties, 181 average allowed, damn good number. 255 Woba, damn good number. 131 ISO, damn good number, given the hard contact. So, um, I think that's really where I would balk a little bit, but everything else is pretty exceptional, to be quite honest. 61% strike one's fine. 35% chase, it's elite. 12% swing strike, it's it's damn good. 28% CSW, pretty damn good. Given all of this, I'd like to a little bit more out of the metrics before I start clicking in you know, with impunity a $9,600 price tag for him, but it's mostly the ownership here and the Delta of this ownership between, you know, he and, and all the other guys at the top, right? That really attracts me here. So I want to get to some Merrill again tonight because Philly is basically just a break-even offense. Now, they're starting to heat up a little bit. Um, they've had two really good games in this series. And with Schwarber and, and Bryce Harper starting to see the baseball a little bit, Bryce Sott hit a ball out, Cody Clemens hit a ball out two, day, two games a day ago, um, you know, this is going to make them very hard to get through. Trey Turner finally had a good night last night. Now, they're expensive. 57 now for Trey. 59 still for Harper. 5K for JTR, who's also had a really good series. 53 for Schwarber. He's going to be the favorite play, I think. And then Harper, of course. I don't really want to go out of my way to play Bryson Stott in this matchup necessarily. But he can still make some hard contact, as can Cody Clemens and Brandon Marsh. So they're playable. Some Phillies over here. Um, I don't really want to go out of my way to do that. I'd probably just side with Merrill Kelly because the Phillies overall, you know, they're hard to get to with 4,900 Castellanos, 5K JTR, and 5,700 Trey Turner when both Schwarber and Harper are also over 5K at 53 and 59. So I just got to side with Merrill Kelly, um, but I think both sides are in play in that regard. It really everybody is in play. Another very interesting tournament game. Um, as it was in really the first two games of this series. Okay, Miami and the Mariners. Yuri Perez, I think he's overpriced here. Um, Now, I love the upside of this kid, similar to a lot of the really young arms for the Marlins. Now, unfortunately for him, um, he's got a bad four-seamer so far. It's bad four-seam command, right? But the changeup's been good. He's got a really good breaking arsenal with the slider and the curveball. Been very equitable for him so far. 
inducing a lot of whiffs, certainly to same-handed hitters, not so much to the left side, but we got a short sample. We'll see how the rest of the arsenal fleshes out. If the changeup value is this good with this 8 to 10 mile an hour velo delta off of the fastball, that's going to continue, and the power numbers to the left side are, are likely to decrease quite a bit going forward. But he's got to figure out the four-seam command, and he's got to he can't just pipe this ball. Um, and that's really what happens. It, it's control mostly, but he'll get on the barrel a little bit to the right-handers with it also. Not so much to the lefties. That's mostly just not throwing a change up too much. And that's where the power is coming from there. But it's a four-seamer that's really the worrisome pitch. 11% um, walk rate here, 57% strike one. So you can see he's kind of spraying it earlier in the count, not allowing him to really work deeper and get to the secondary offerings to allow him to induce all of this swing and miss. 28% CSW with a 13% swing, swinging strike rate, super attractive for a 21-year-old or however old he is, right? However, bad fastball here, he's not going to throw all that much, right? They're, they're capping this kid at about 80, 85 pitches every single start. So at 9,000, I think he's overpriced um, because we have probably a max of five-inning upside for him unless he just absolutely blast through the Mariners here and given the contact profile so far I'm not sure that's really in the tank all that regularly um I mean you're essentially capped here at about five five and two-thirds maybe a full six innings uh I think that's pretty unlikely though um so I'm probably just going to stay off the Yuri Perez here tonight even though I do like the strikeout upside and the high upside uh future for him um, he just needs to go deeper in the game before I start paying 9K for him. Luis Castillo on the mound for the Mariners. Um, 9,800 for him. I think he's fine, right? 30% ownership. I think it's fine. Everything in the underlying metrics is fine. However, he does have a 10% barrel rate. It's his changeup still, man. He does get on to the barrel a little bit with the four-seamer. Two-seamer, he throws a bit too much to opposite-handed hitters for my liking. Um, you know, my liking would be 0%. But uh, I think you guys know that by now. It's the changeup that's still bad. He comes in sort of three quarters and, and submarines it a little bit sometimes. Not just a change, four seam or two. And that that floats him in the middle of the strike zone sometimes. And that's why we see an elevated 185 ISO to the left side of the plate, 32% hard. But he does this when he does it with the four seamer, I should say. That's what leads to the to the hard contact against righties as well, 37% there. So despite the very attractive strikeout stuff, he can get on the barrel a little bit sometimes, and he's just a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. So um, that makes him a little bit attackable. And when we eat 30, 40% ownership on the guy, you know, that's variance that um, doesn't quite get accounted for, right? So we have to be mindful of that. 9,800, I'd rather just drop down to Glass now and eat the ownership there than do it on Castillo. But that doesn't mean that Castillo is a bad play. Um, I mean, the, the matchup is just, I think Glasnow wins kind of hands down because the matchup is far better against Oakland than against the Marlins when Luis Castillo's got to deal with the pest of Luis Arise at the top of the lineup. And he gives up so much hard contact to the right side of the plate when he's got to deal with Georgie Soler and Brian De La Cruz from the right side as well. So, um, you know, bad changeup is going to make him susceptible to a rise for sure. And to a guy like uh, Jesus Sanchez, for example. So I don't really want to get too crazy with the Luis Castillo ownership here tonight. Uh, I'm going to have a, a good bit for sure. Don't get me wrong. But my, my preference is absolutely glass now. Against righties this season, just a 22.5% K rate, whereas Oakland's, what, 26 and 27%? 90 WRC plus, Oakland is far worse, right? Buck 40 ISO here for the Marlins. Oakland's still far worse. Hard contact, Oakland is worse, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. So uh, I think Glasnow wins pretty much hands down. Um, and at similar ownership figures, I'd rather just play him. But Castillo is in play. If you got to make choices, I'm just going to go with Glasnow. But, um, you know, he's cheaper and, and, you know, we went through all of it. But, uh, so that's kind of where I stand on that. I don't really want to play a lot of the Mariners necessarily. They're still bad, you know, against right-handed pitching, but kind of heating up a little bit. WRC Plus starting to tick up. 25% K rate, still a tackable number there with Yuri, but I'm not playing him. So, um, you know, it, is there really all that much upside for him there? I'm not sure. 
ISO starting to tick up for them, 33% hard contact also starting to tick up over the last little while. So you want to play a Julio, Ty France, Tay Oscar, think it's fine. You want to throw in a Kelnick and a Cal Raleigh. That's a nice little five man there. I'm probably staying off of Gino tonight um, against right-handers. I very rarely play him. So that would be my preferred Seattle stack, but I'm kind of lukewarm on it. Uh, because I still do respect the upside of Yuri here, even though he's only going to go about five innings. Okay, let's move on to Cleveland and San Diego. 7,700 for Aaron Savali here. Now, he's got six pitches. He throws a lot of junk, but all of it's kind of okay. Um, you know, it's not, like, super impressive. This is a bad strikeout matchup for him. He only has 16% in the, in the tank. I think he's probably overpriced for that, and I'd rather play some other guys. Um but so far this season, elite strike one rate, 73%. He sequences very well. And that's what keeps him in a starting rotation compared to a guy like a Zach Plesak, who doesn't have overwhelming stuff himself, who got DFA'd by Cleveland, and Savali's still in the rotation, right? So um, good chase here because he throws so much junk. Keeping left-handers off balance a little bit with this cutter and a curveball combination. It's a, it's a, unique, um, a, a unique usage here. In, in being so heavy on the cutter and so heavy on the curveball, usually when you see that, it's it's heavy cutter slider, uh, and it's really not. It's curveball. So that's a, a little bit interesting, um, and that's you know something that opposing lineups don't often deal with. So I think that puts him in the upper echelon of the guys I don't want to play uh, category, if that makes sense. Um, 7700 for him. It's mostly the price tag here that I don't want to go after. But San Diego's also just a bad offense, man. Um, and, and these guys, every one of them, Tati 64, Soto 61, Manny is 56, Bogart's 55, and Cronenworth is 5,000 now. Even Gary Sanchez is 4,300. Now, sure, you got three guys down at the bottom with a Rugi Odor or a Hassan Kim at second base, Matt Carpenter at first base, uh, or even a Trent Grisham, who I never play, who is bad. Uh, they're all cheap enough to make stacks happen, but, like, I don't really want to do that because they're majorly expensive. I'd rather just go play the Dodgers, who we'll get to in the next game. Um, so I'm not all that jacked about playing the Padres. I do kind of want to play some just because of the coverage. I do think Cronenworth is heating up. He's a really good hitter. We talked about him yesterday. Same thing with Soto, Tatis, and, yeah, of course, Manny and Bogarts. So that's fine, but eh, I don't know. I think Aaron Savali's got enough in the tank here in this in this arsenal being so spread out in the fastballs and with the curveball to survive and maybe go about five innings and suppress a, a little bit of production here. So kind of lukewarm on the Padres. I'll get to some, but I'm not overly impressed, to be quite honest, mostly due to their price tags. Michael Walk on the mound, if I'm going to play any Padres, probably just going to be him. 8,200 on the mound for Waka at 15-point median projection so far. It's pretty damn good. Decent value score, pretty damn good. In the 8K range, I think this is okay. Um... And is he my favorite? Eh, I don't know. I mean, I really like Lively. I'd pr probably rather drop down to him. Um, I think Andrew Heaney is in play. I prefer Waka probably to any of these guys. I do like Justin Verlander a little bit too at 8K, 8K flat. But Verlander is going to get the ownership here. Michael Waka has seen 5% so far against Cleveland. I mean, so I'd rather do this. You know why? It's because of the changeup. He's got an elite changeup here. It's always been his best pitch. 27% strikeout rate to the left side of the plate. Even though Cleveland is not going to strike out a lot, he's going to be able to neutralize power to the lefties here. Induces 19% soft, very high ground ball, or, or, uh, ground ball to fly ball ratio. In terms of the fly balls, I should say fly ball to ground ball ratio. Very... Um, very hard to attack with uh, opposing offenses. 27% um, hard is a good figure against opposing or opposite-handed hitters, rather. Good numbers against lefties, so I don't really want any of the lefties from Cleveland. It, I mean, you could play him, don't get me wrong. You play Josie at 4,700. You could play an Andre Jimenez. You could play Stephen Kwan. You could even play Josh Naylor or Josh Bell, whatever. Um but mostly I'd want right-handers here. 34% hard allowed against right-handers this season. 168 ISO. These are still good numbers for Waka, don't get me wrong. But far more attackable, 5-6% lower strikeout rate to the left side. A little bit more on a line um, at an 080 ground ball to fly ball. But the raw line drive percentage, it can get kind of noisy sometimes in the calculations. We'll get into that later. 
Still, it's just 18% here, so not overly attackable there either. If you want to play a righty, it'd be a Med Rosario, 3,400, or maybe a Mike, Mike Zanino at 2,700, um, capitalizing on the lower strikeout stuff. But overall, I think Michael Walker is very much in play, and I'd just side with him instead of Cleveland at 5% ownership. I think there's 25 in the tank for Walker in this particular matchup because the changeup is so good. It's still hard to get through Cleveland and a 19% strikeout rate, don't get me wrong. 86 WRC plus two, though, and a buck 22 ISO. 25% hard, like whatever. Like too many ground balls for these guys. I mean, that, that puts them on a line here and against a fly ball pitcher, bad ball wise. It's a fine profile matchup for Cleveland. So that would take me off a of walk a little bit. And yeah, I mean, it's Michael Walker. You're not too thrilled about, you know, clicking in a lot of him. Pretty much ever. But uh, I think it puts him in play. It's mostly the ownership delta um, between he and Verlander, um, you know, getting a, what, fifth of the ownership here. I, that I think is pretty attractive. So some Padres maybe against Aaron Savali. I don't really want to play him. I think he's probably overpriced here. Uh, but I think really both of these pitchers are in play. If you land on an Aaron Savali, he has six innings in him here, I think. Um, cause he's incredibly efficient and he's got a lot of junk that he throws. So mostly off of offense for the most part. Okay. Let's get to uh, the White Sox in Cleveland here. Uh, Clevenger on the mound, uh, for the White Sox, 6,000 for him. No, thank you. Not, not dealing with this against Dodgers. He gives up too much power to lefties and he has a 15% strikeout rate, 12% walk rate. No, thanks. Now they did, um, miss Max Muncy last night. He strained his hammy on Sunday, so he might be out again there tonight. And I'd still like to get to Jason Hayward and David Peralta, even though Peralta is the one that hit the bomb last night. I still think Jason Hayward is probably my favorite. He'll likely be in the four uh, or the five. James Outman I like at 3,600 here. And you can always play Mookie and Freddie and JD at the top. Um, we'll see what they want to do with Will Smith and Austin Barnes. If Austin, I kind of prefer that Austin Barnes is in there tonight, so I don't have to stomach or make the decision to fade Will Smith uh, against Clev here at you know, 9,000 or whatever the damn price is on, on Will Smith. So um, I want to get to this, to as much Dodgers as I can tonight, as much, of, as much of the Dodgers, I should say, but they're expensive still. Mookie's 65, Freddie is 63 still, and JD is 54. Um, the other guys make it far more palatable, so that's why I'd, I'd like Will Smith out. I do want to play him, but I don't want to play him because he's so expensive. So give me Hayward, give me Peralta, give me a little bit of Chris Taylor, too, at 3,000 flat and outfield and shortstop eligibility. I think that's a playable construction. But I like James Outman here, 36. I think he matches up pretty well against Clev. So no thank you for Clevenger. Kershaw tonight, yeah, I want to get to this. I think I'd prefer him to Fran Valdez. Um, and definitely to Garrett Cole, I'll tell you that. But the field does, too. So that allows us some ownership pivots. Um you know, that we can make here with Kershaw on the mound. But uh, there's nothing wrong with Kershaw. I think he's really rounding back into form here. And the numbers against right-handers this season are fantastic. 33% K rate, sub-6% walk rate, buck 40 ground ball to fly ball, average 31% hard contact, um, you know, inducing 18% soft. I mean, it, it, everything is elite with Kershaw, and it always has been. He's just had those three down starts because the guy's freaking mom died, you know. So let's give him a break. And his past two starts have been excellent. Against Yankees, seven innings, nine Ks. Against Cincinnati, seven innings, nine Ks. So let's do it again. I'm not really all that worried about going after the White Sox, even though they're pretty right-handed heavy here. Um, Tim Anderson would be the only bat I'm kind of concerned with because he doesn't strike out a lot against lefties, and he has a really good hit tool against them, but he doesn't have a lot of power against them uh, over his last couple of seasons. Um Yoan Moncada, we want him more from the left side. He's still cheap, though. Luis Robert, I'm not paying a regular price tag of 49. Andrew Vaughn, Jake Berger, they're going to strike out a lot in this matchup. Uh, Grandal back at Dodger Stadium. Yeah, it's been a couple years, whatever. He's going to, like, I, I want him more from the left side, too. Um, and I don't really want to deal with Clint Frazier, Romy Gonzalez, or even an Elvis Andrews down at the bottom. So uh, give me all the Kershaw, and he's the guy I want to play up in the upper 10Ks. And probably even in the lower 10Ks, too, uh, above Framber. Um, I think Kershaw is just a better arm. And I've got far fewer concerns with Kershaw in the arsenal than I do with uh, Framber and, and a Garrett Cole. So give me the Dodgers and Kershaw pretty much off of the White Sox exclusively this evening. 
Uh, okay, so that's it for the breakdown. Let's uh, get out of here and go over a review real quick and then get out of here, I suppose. Toronto and Baltimore. Give me some Toronto tonight. Uh, less on the Baltimore, but short stacks in play for sure. Probably no pitching. Um, other guys that I like more than Barrios. Still a difficult matchup for him. And definitely no Kyle Bradish. Yankees, Mets, Garrett Cole, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. But he's average, Garrett Cole. I don't want to pay 11000 for him, to be honest. Give me some Verlander, yeah. I think I'm, I'm looking for a little bit of a bounce here. Um, but you could pivot off of this and play, uh, who was it, Michael Walker down here, or even an Aaron Savali if you want to uh, throw up in your mouth a little bit. Colorado and Boston, I don't, let's go back to this game. Uh, I don't really want to play any offense here necessarily. Respect both of these arms um, and don't really respect both of those offenses. Colorado and Boston. No Gomber, definitely, um, or definitely not. No Whitlock, really, for me. Maybe a piece here or there, but I, I think I think Colorado could really get to him. I like Colorado off the board here a little bit tonight. Um, away from Coors Field, still in Fenway. And Boston, definitely, yeah, we want to go after Gomber tonight. Uh, Angels, Texas, no Reed Detmers for me. I just can't do it with the guy. Very little Andrew Heaney tonight, I think. I think it's a super sneaky, bad matchup for him. But he does have, at very low ownership, super high upside with the strikeout stuff. So um, it's a tough spot, and he's in play in tournaments, but mostly just offense here for me. Pittsburgh, Chicago. I like Pittsburgh a little bit here tonight. Chicago, yeah, um, but they might be a little bit overly popular given that they, they get a triple-A arm here. But I think it's it's warranted, sure, to get some exposure here. They're at cheap enough price tags, and this is a triple-A arm with uh, mediocre numbers there. Washington, Houston. Washington piece here or there against Framber because he's got a bad change. And Framber, yeah, definitely. Um, some exposure, but not like an outsized amount. Uh, you know, it's, I, it's still really hard to get through Washington, man. Houston, sure, against JoJo. Um, if you land on a 6,600 JoJo, probably going to have a hard time convincing me, but it's not the craziest play in the world. Ben Lively at 6,800. I want to play a lot of this tonight if I can. Daniel Lynch, I want to play zero of this if I can. And Cincinnati, I want to play some of that. Maybe a couple Royals pieces too, but probably very few. Tampa, Oakland, Tampa definitely. All the glass now that I can get. No Luis Medina, maybe just like a Seth Brown or something from Oakland. Philly and Arizona, um, less enthused about Philly here tonight, mostly due to their pricing and the matchup. I kind of like Merrill Kelly a little bit. I want to play him at low ownership. A little worried though. I want to go back to Schwarber. Uh, he's still at 5,300 and he hits bomb every night now. So let's go. Arizona, though, you could get to some sneaky stacks against Ranger Suarez, but he's in play, too, at 5,600. He's a better arm than that price tag. Miami and Seattle, I'm off of most offensive uh, pieces here. Yuri Perez can't play him because he's overpriced, and he's only going to go five innings. Luis Castillo, sure, but he's very popular, and he's got a suspect changeup. In a kind of a down strikeout matchup for him, but uh, I'm okay getting there. Um, I'd rather just play, play Glass now if I had to choose between the two. A Seattle stack is in play, definitely. Cleveland, probably just off of it against Michael Walker, But, I mean, Michael Walker's is Michael Walker, and you can go after him with a low strikeout team. Aaron Savali, as I mentioned, is in play. It's not super thrilling. And I kind of want to get to a little bit of the Padres, but they might just miss the cut for me. I don't know. I, I think this offense just stinks, and I don't like the price tags there. White Sox, Dodgers, no White Sox, all of the Dodgers, and give me Kershaw as much as I can get as well. So that's it. We're done here. Um, projections and, low, and ownership are loaded to the site. Keep an eye out for updates as always. Good luck to everybody on the Wednesday 12 Gamer.